Hello everyone, and as always, welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo, where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. And today, I couldn't be more excited. We have got the release version of Distant Worlds 2. So this game is coming out in three days on Thursday, March 10th of the year 2022. Uh, but we've got it a few days early here, so I'm going to start a Let's Play tutorial. What the heck is that? Well, on my channel, I like to teach you how to play the game. So we could sit here and watch me play and say I could tell you how fantastic I am. Uh, it's all true, sure. Uh, but I would rather show you how to play the game so you can go enjoy it yourself. So sometimes I do tutorials, sometimes I do do Let's Plays, but uh, let's play tutorials when I slow it down, we play the game, and we talk about concepts and how the game works, game mechanics, as we go along. So I'm going to play a game here from the very start screen. You're seeing what I'm seeing, and uh, we're going to go start a new game and just go through all of the steps of how you set up a game, how it gets going, what you want to look for at the start, and uh, how those mechanics work. Okay, so on the start screen here, it's pretty simple. There's not a whole lot to do here. Uh, settings would be the only thing, but I'm going to keep these all default, except I have turned off the sound uh, because I don't want it to, to distract us while we go to work. So we're going to start a new game. And when you start a new game of Distant Worlds, whether it be Universe or 2 here, it's all uh, there's all so many options of how you can set up your game depending on what you want. Now, we don't have any mods yet. Uh, I would imagine if it's anything like Distance Wor Distant Worlds Universe, there will be a million mods eventually, but we're going to play straight from the vanilla here. Okay, Galaxy Shape. Well, that's pretty self-explanatory. You can read through that. We're going to play a Spiral Galaxy. Uh, I, you know, that's the default. It makes the most sense. Uh, it's kind of what you're familiar with uh, as you get going. Maybe you want to do a big ring, no center galaxy. I don't know what kind of craziness you're into, uh, but we're going to do a spiral galaxy stars. Well, we're going to do the default here as well. I'm going to try to stick to the defaults where I can or where it makes sense, unless I just know something uh, is a little funky with the default. Uh, but really, brand new game, probably just stick with the default. 700 stars. This goes all the way up to 2000 now the ori original distant worlds universe you needed some mods to get up to 2000 uh but here you know you can go there that's a huge huge universe or galaxy i should say nebula density the amount of nebula clouds in the galaxy lower nebula density makes navigation easier whereas higher nebula density makes finding paths through nebula more challenging and provides more geography in the galaxy so if we did go dense here there are just more uh places in space you can't go think of them as any other 4x game where you would have like mountains or something similar idea you just can't travel through those zones or at least you can't do so easily you have to go around them or or, or otherwise so we're just going to stick normal here galaxy size of course the smaller your galaxy the more packed in the different civilizations are going to be probably the more challenging it's going to be if you start out here it's going to be all about research and kind of building your own empire before you, uh, you know, encounter any other civilization. So we're going to, again, stick with the default. This just kind of gives us a nice picture of what we're going to be playing here. Okay, galaxy settings. Uh, galaxy expansion pre-warp. Now, warp in this game, obviously very important uh, because that's how you get... Uh, far distances fast uh, so if you want to travel long distances you've got to get that warp well i like to start pre-warp uh, it's kind of fun just to slowly move around in your little solar system first then you're going to be researching the warp technology then you can get out and get going it allows you to get used to the game before uh, you're kind of thrown into situations you don't really know what's going on tech level pre-warp we're going to do that, of course, later on when you play the game, you're more familiar with it. Maybe you want to start a little closer to the mid game, right? So you just go straight to level seven. Galaxy Aggression. It's a restless galaxy. What is this, a soap opera? Sure. Uh, we'll start with red. We'll keep it there. I want it to be restless. Hell, I'm restless. Let's go. Difficulty. Uh, let's do normal. Um... I'm tempted to go to hard just because I don't want it to be too easy for us. Uh, I'm going to play this game probably all the way through the end. Uh, 
Oh, I tell you what, let's go to hard. Now, it doesn't tell us what the difference is here, right? There's no tool tip. Uh, I'm just assuming hard is, is harder than normal. So we're going to go to hard and make it a little more, a little tougher on us, okay? Rece I would assume that's going to slow down our research speed, give other civilizations better research uh, bumps, uh, maybe give us more pirates. Pirates are a big feature in this game that will kind of slow you down at the start. Uh, so those sorts of things. Uh, I'll read in the manual later, uh, but you get the idea. Research speed, we'll just do that normal. Look, if you want to make it tough on yourself, just slow it down. Or if really, it kind of, you know, it elongates the game. Uh, let's put it that way. Normal. Research visibility. Only next projects visible. I really like this. They've just introduced this in this game. Uh, where you can't plan out the next 16 research projects to get to that one, like, star killer that you want. You have to go one by one, and it only, un, you know, shows you the next choice. I like that. Random research paths. Same idea, this just got introduced, and it's, um, you don't really know what's coming next. You know, just because one time you got a certain kind of shield doesn't mean the level two of that shield comes next. You know, that's just a random example. Uh, speaking of which, random research paths, let's do it. Allow tech trading. Okay, I'll leave that on. Uh, sometimes I feel like it's a little gamey, but I I'll leave that on. Threats. Pirates, normal, that's fine. Pirate strength, normal, that's fine. Again, these are just like uh, barbarians in other 4X games. You know, they, they sort of give you a little challenge early on, get you used to warfare and how it works, and uh, slow you down a little bit. Uh, pirate proximity, average, okay. Pirates respawn, I want them to stay dead. You know, if we kill something, I don't want to see it again. Uh, I don't think that's fair. So we're just going to have them stay dead. And that is also the default. So that's good. Space creatures. Uh, sure. Why not? Space creatures are fun. Uh, many space creatures are dangerous and can pose threats to your ships and bases. However, they may also provide resources that you can use. Good to know. Normal. Fine. Colonization. Colony prevalence normal now these are different planets that are going to be you know good for your species to colonize they could also be you know npcs i call them uh, but they're just uh, tribes essentially that are on different planets that you could then you know get them bribe them take them over whatever the case may be to set up a colony there um so we're going to keep that normal independent colonies well i guess i just covered that independent alien populations are distributed throughout the galaxy at the start of the game this setting determines how many of these populations exist so normal the colony prevalence is the influences the general quality of planet okay i was a little wrong on that influences the general quality of planets and moons in the galaxy thus determining the number of potential colonies okay uh, colony influence range, the size of influence circles that are projected out from colonies. Colony influence determines your empire territory, i.e. which star systems belong to your empire. So when you set up a colony, you know, you throw out this uh, radiance uh, of your uh, power, right? And so this is how far that range would get out. If you want to, you know, not throw out that much power or influence, you can dial that back or dial it up. Colonization range limit. Whether colonization range limits are applied, if turned on, new colonies must be within the specified distance from one of your existing colonies. Now, when we're first starting out and you're starting out, you're not going to have any clue uh, what you know what you should set that at so we're going to stay at the default so we will need to set up uh, colonies within 200 million clicks of uh, our uh, current colony that we have okay next our race now this uh, we get into the fun stuff here there are at the start here seven different races okay and they all kind of comport to a different component of the game. What do I mean by that? Well, Mortalins are militaristic. Uh, Akdarians are more research-oriented, okay? Uh, you know, humans are actually, like, kind of negotiators, diplomacy. So it kind of depends which portion of a 4X game you like to play. Let's just kind of read through these because it's, it's really important. It's the kind of thing that uh, can really affect your gameplay. Actarians, they're highly industrious, semi-aquatic marine mammals. They have large webbed hands. Okay, well, none of that's important. Um, <laughs> they're excellent swimmers. You wanted to know that, right? Um, 
Agdarians are intelligent, peaceful, and friendly. They have a rich culture that focuses on a hybrid nature of their living environment encompassing both water and land. Okay, so the most important parts there that we'll focus on with these other uh, races, intelligent, peaceful, friendly. Intelligence is going to be the science part, right? Uh, Bascara, they're ferocious insects. Oh boy, that sounds scary. Uh, they excel at combat, trickery, and deceit to gain the upper hand. All right, they're untrustworthy allies so they like to expand are okay the hakonish they're a bipedal reptilian race um what does it say they are intelligent and quite aggressive hakonish are highly pretentious they also have see we could read more here right and let's actually do that because you can go back and look at your mo or you can go and look at your modifiers and this is what it's really going to come down to you know we can read through all of the uh, fancy literature if we want or you can just see the bonuses you get and you're going to get a really high uh you know understanding of what they've got so actarians lower aggression they're neutral caution they're careful dependability they're you know neutral reproduction rate is moderate colonization modifiers they're best on ocean planets well imagine that or deep ocean planets they don't like desert planets uh that makes sense all research they get a plus five percent construction they get a plus 15 percent maintenance ship maintenance plus five ship construction plus 10 and ship energy plus five and these are their feelings towards other races we're you know you're always going to be negative towards other races uh it's they're everybody's xenophobic in this game uh humans negative 20 that's not bad and the little tekens negative 20. we don't really like mortalins we definitely don't like Bascara. Uh, we do not like Diut, Diutes. Uh, we certainly don't like them. So it's really Diutes that we uh, particularly hate along with the Bascara. Okay, so we don't like insects for whatever reason. The Bascara over here, they're very aggressive. They're reckless. They're very unreliable. Their reproduction rate is plus 8%. Now, we saw with the Akdarians, it was plus 6%, right? That makes a big difference when you start talking about over years and years and years. Their assimilation rate when they are trying to take over other uh, um races is resistant they, they you know they don't they don't assimilate very well let's put it that way uh they like volcanic uh planets and carbonaceous planets sulfuric volcanic planets that's what they like they do not like deep ocean uh, so they don't like the planets that Akdarians like at all. You can see the colonization minimum quality. Now, when you go to colonize a planet, it's uh, sometimes got to have a minimum quality about it, even if it's one that you're particularly attracted to. So if we took the Bascara and we find a nice volcanic planet, we're like, okay, let's go down and colonize that. It's got to at least be 40% colonizable. And we'll look at that as we go on. Uh, bonuses, weapons, that's what they like war weariness reduction they just don't get worn out they'll fight all day uh their their population is uh for war ground attack strength plus 10 mining rate so they're good miners and they uh you know this is all militaristic right plus the mining uh they don't like anybody okay <laughs> hakonish hakonish are slightly aggressive not as much as the Bascara. Bascara is plus 40 the hakonish plus 15 caution they're neutral dependability they're slightly unreliable reproduction rate that's actually lower than the Akdarians and three percent lower than the Bascara uh their migration tendency yeah they don't really migrate a whole lot now in this game uh there is migration patterns there's even a overlay on the map for migration so something to keep in mind they uh their assimilation rate is resistant they like swampy lands Okay, and you can see here they're reptilian, uh, so they're going to like swampy. They're pretty good on ocean, forest, mangrove forest they really like, okay? Uh, they don't like ice or deserts. Uh, they are good at engine research, counter espionage, hyperdrive, hyperjump, so they really like to travel, uh, and they're good at at researching those type of things their war weariness reduction again they're an aggressive species so it's plus 20 percent that's a good thing right anything in green generally is good they really don't like the diutes man these diutes nobody likes them uh they also don't like the gazarians 
okay and you can read through that if that's what you want to pick the humans uh they like continental forest and grasslands uh their bonuses all research they get a plus five they get a plus 10 on diplomacy uh plus 10 on espionage they like their trader free trade uh nafta out here right uh Buscara, they really don't like people don't like insects and they don't like diutes um and you can also see here, I haven't gone down this far because we haven't picked any the race, uh, but you see their preferred government types and their allowed government types. Uh, also, you see their default infantry. So there is infantry warfare down on planets in this one. Um, and these do differ depending on how warlike the species is. So uh, if we go back to Bascara, which are very warlike, their infantry, if you saw the humans, it's 5,000 infantry, but their attack and defense for the Bascara starts at 135. Okay, let's go to the humans and see. I think it's a little bit lower. Yeah, it's 120. If we go to the uh, Actarians, it's 90. You know, I mean, they're, they don't like planetary warfare, per se, or at least their units are a lot weaker at creation. Uh, the Mortalins, very aggressive. They're neutral when it comes to caution. Very dependable, though. They're fierce half-mammal, half-reptiles. Uh, and again, a lot of this will give you clues about what they're good at. Um, they like sandy deserts, rocky deserts, and desert savannas. Uh, but they do need a minimum quality, just like uh, the Hakonish needed. Uh, their bonuses, war weariness reduction, okay, weapons research, armor research, mining rate. So it seems like, you know, if you're good at warfare, you like to mine as well for whatever reason. Ship maneuvering, plus 20, troop recovery, okay, damage control. So they really are good at warfare in the skies, certainly. They do not like most people around 50 or 40%. They like military dictatorships and feudalism, uh, although they are allowed to do republics, for per se, if you wanted to do that. Uh, Tekans, these are my guys. I like these small, furry, rodent-like race with three eyes. Of course they have. Why wouldn't they have three eyes? Uh, they like to hoard. Okay. Uh, they're not very aggressive. They're somewhat cautious. Their reproduction rate is uh, pretty high. These little guys uh, like to have some fun, uh, pour some wine, and listen to some soft music. Uh, migration tendency, plus 30%. They are adventurers. They like to move around a lot. Their assimilation rate is actually quite high as well. They particularly like sandy desert planets, uh, rocky desert, desert savanna. They really uh, not a big fan of deep ocean. 40% uh, colonization quality, minimum quality for sandy desert. Okay, their bonuses, they're really good miners, plus 20. Uh, they also can contain damage on their ships pretty well. They like to trade quite a bit, and they build ships pretty fast. They really don't like Mortalins. Uh, Mortalins are big and scary. That's probably why. And then finally, we have the Xenox. And if you've ever had a uh, house cat, uh, you know what their personality is like. These are um, a feline race with thick golden fur. Uh, they are very cautious. Uh, well, again, they're, they're house cats. Uh, caution, plus 40%. Very careful. Reproduction rates, moderate. Okay, assimilation, assimilation rate, negative 10. They're adaptable. They like ice planets. So they're the only race we've seen so far that really like ice planets. Uh, that's where uh, they thrive. So you see here, ice, ice, tundra. They do have a minimum quality bonuses. Uh, they re shield recharge rate. They like shields. Shield rate, shield research, espionage. They're good at counter espionage and psyops. All right. Uh, they like to spy. Okay, so this is kind of your spies. These are your traveler trader types. Warfare for the Mortalins. Humans are negotiators, uh, trade, um, diplomacy. The Hakonish, uh, they do a little bit of everything. If you look at them again, where are they getting their bonuses? It's really all about the engines. They like to get out there and travel uh, in the stars. The Bascara are the most 
aggressive. Uh, are they more aggressive than the mortal? They are. Yeah, 40% as opposed to 30%. They're the most aggressive. You know, think of them as the hive mind. They are these insects, uh, probably the least popular <laughs> uh, race in the game. That's why we should probably play them. Not a lot of people do, but I almost always play the Actarians, and I know that's pretty that's pretty default as well. The Actarians are great because they are good at research, and I always like research in these games. It's just more fun. Um, they're very famous for cultivating Nephtha seaweed also. They're masters of underwater construction, and they love ocean planets. Okay, so all research. This is where we're going to be getting all of our bonuses. I am going to do this Let's Play to tutorial as the Octar Akdarians because I'm just most familiar with them and so I want to give you the most information I can it's all about you learning the game so they like technocracies or republics will po probably play as a republic but they are allowed you know many different kinds of government types just depending on how you want to play they are very weak when it comes to infantry though your empire and government empire name let's call this the Ak supremacy all right Sounds very aggressive. We'll keep this light blue flag because that just looks like the Actarians. Uh, technocracy. Okay, this is where we'll pick and it shows you the different government types we could pick. Very important at the start of the game. Technac <laughs> Technocratic governments place engineers, scientists, and technical experts in control. Decision makers are selected based upon how knowledgeable and capable they are. Technocracies are typically highly efficient and free from corruption. However, they often enforce tight control over their citizens' behavior. This loss of personal freedom can sometimes lead to unrest. Okay, so the pop, these, you know, again, here we get down to where the rubber meets the road, which is what bonuses are we going to get? Population growth, negative 10. Counter espionage, plus 10, because we're a controlled society, right? All research, we get a plus 20. Colony happiness, minus 10. Colony corruption reduction, plus 10. And our mining rate is negative 10. Uh, you know, there's some real negatives here, whether it be the population growth or the mining rate. Let's look at Republic. Republic now gives us a plus 5 population growth. And it says governments that are led by a head of state who is usually elected. So we would have elections. The head of state, called the president, serves for a term. Um, citizens of republics typically enjoy many freedoms. They invariably divide government carefully. Um, the president controls the executive area. Okay, it's the American government is what they're trying to recreate, even if it doesn't work like that in practice. Um, let's do a republic. It's going to give us population growth. We do get war weariness faster, but we're going to try to, you know, do a lot of science. We're going to try to build up our colonies, make it a very flourishing society. We're not very good at counter espionage either because it's a more free society, right? Diplomacy, we're, you know, got a nice little bonus there. All research, we get a plus five. Now that's opposed to the technocracy where we get uh, a plus 20. I mean, that's a huge advantage, right? Uh, but because we pick the Actarians, we already get a bonus for research uh, that will add on to this plus five. Colony happiness plus 10. Our troop re recruitment, recovery, and maintenance is all negative. Corruption reduction plus 20, though. We also get good tourism and trade income. So we are going to pick the Republic. I usually think it's the strongest with the Actarians. Uh, because again, you're already getting a bonus just because of your race uh, for research, and then you got to get some other nice stuff, including the all-important population growth. Okay, home system, normal. All right, we're just going to keep it default normal. Expansion, starting. Empires start with a single small colony and no ships or bases. Build a spaceport and then begin expanding into the surrounding star systems. Okay, random, it could be anything. Young means you have two to four colonies already. Uh, when we go to the home system here, let's just read these uh, really quickly. The favorability of your home system. This includes factors like resource abundance, population level of your home colony. Again, you know, you can make it a lot tougher on yourself if you want. Tech level, we already picked. That's pre-warp. Starting location, random, 
deep core, outer core, or the far regions? Well, uh, you know, you can kind of figure this out by yourself, right? I mean, the deep core, the far regions, the outer, so this would be outer core, deep core, uh, far regions, right? I'm going to say random. I don't know. Let the game pick for us and make it fun. Other empires. Okay. Auto, auto generates starting empires. When enabled, the specified number of empires are automatically generated. Okay. The empire and race characteristics are randomly assigned. However, the galaxy expansion setting influences how large these influencers are. Um, and... But you can pick them yourself, right? So if you, we go here, we can add our own empire. So if you have a game and you're like, I just want to play against all Hakonish. I don't know why you would want to do that, but you can do that if you want. This is random. When you have it on on, it's random. And the, the game will place them out there. It'll be different races, uh, different uh, government types, different starting locations. I like that. Territory on. Start a new game, victory code conditions we will leave this to the default but again it's something you have a lot of control over territory um the victory th threshold this is the portion of the selected victory conditions that must be met so you would need to control 75 percent of the galaxy okay 75 percent of the population economy 75 percent of the economy going on in the game these are all victory conditions uh, so there's numerous ones i like that about this game it's not like well we just have to take all the star systems right now you could play that way you could get rid of these and put on territory 100 percent and then you could just play a full land grab game right uh where you try to take over the whole galaxy and that's that uh but no Let's just do the different kinds because, you know, different uh, victory paths can be fun. We could just build up a huge economy, trade with everybody, and win the game. Race victory conditions on. So your race, we're the Actarians here, will have very specialized victory conditions as well. They can, they can go up a chain and win the game even if they don't meet this other, these other criteria, right? Victory threshold, 70%. Sets the percentage of victory conditions that must be fulfilled to win the game. So, right, this has to um, kind of work with this, right? So, if you want it to be all, you have to have all three of these to win, and your race victory conditions, you can put on 100%. Or you could just do 70%, meaning we, we need three of the four. Does that make sense? Um, so, these just kind of work together. Start date and years, zero. Uh, that's fine. Uh, you could start later on, right? Time limit years. Game finishes after a certain, after the specified number of years. The winner is the Empire with the greatest strategic value at this time. So you could just play for, let's say, 100 years or 1,000 years if you wanted to. And whoever leads at the end based on the criteria that they call, what do they call that? Strategic value, which is just a kind of a... Uh, algorithm of what this stuff is you could do it that way if you want we're going to leave both those off general story events on uh, there's going to be ancient ruins abandoned ships the game does tell a story that will sort of unfold and i've heard that it kind of ties into the first game a little bit not that you had to have played the first game to understand it race specific story events we're going to have those on so certain things will happen to the actarians or the tekans that won't happen to the other right so that's interesting i think gives a little variety and colony events uh disasters plagues etc on i like that randomness it makes it fun okay let's start the game so we've gone through all of that i i know we understand it to a hundred percent and we are going to get out here look around see where our starting location is uh what kind of advantages we have from that if we have any and we're also going to go to automation uh, but we may do that next time our faction is known as the act supremacy our government is a republic we are the actarian who are typically careful actarians have natural skills in all research construction research ship maintenance savings ship construction speed and ship energy savings all very important to know, right? Our leader is Vas Sarafu, and there is a nice role-playing aspect to this game. And so, you know, you're going to have characters that have different traits, which give you different bonuses. He's skilled in high-tech research, 
industrial research and colony corruption reduction. Wow, that's great. Okay, cool. Our home colony is Trawas. Wow, that's going to be a tw tongue twister for me at some point. Trawas. Okay, a deep ocean planet in the Escalon system. Nearby is the gas giant pl planet Escalon 5. Also nearby is the rocky metallic moon Yerpa Miva. Wow, Europe, we may change the name. Now, in this game, you can change the name to anything you want for anything you want. Um, before we get started, I just want to say in Distant Worlds 2, you can automate or manually control pretty much anything that you want. So if you only want to control the big kind of overall empire stuff and kind of just play this guy as uh, the leader and you just make these big, big decisions, you can turn everything else over to the AI. Or if you're a control freak like me, you can control everything. And to learn this game, we're going to go through on the slowest speed setting and control everything and we're going to pause and we're going to talk about uh, the mechanics and the concepts as we go the other important thing to know about distant worlds 2 is there are two different economies that operate here you are the axe supremacy or we are i'm going to say we are you're playing with me we are the axe supremacy the axe supremacy is the government obviously Okay, I mean, it's all of our peoples, but what are we really controlling is the government. Now, how much of that government you want to control, like I said, you can automate a lot of things in this game if you don't want to control it. But we are the Axe Supremacy. That means we're going to be doing the governmental functions. Um, there is also underlying that, and you will see it on the map, a complete and total separate civilian economy and that civilian economy really operates completely outside of your control the only exception to that is if you uh, pick to be a mercantile guild you can control the civilian economy somewhat so what does that mean practically that means we'll be building the big uh, capital type ships and ports and bases right but our people will be doing the smaller mining ships, the civilian um, cargo ships. They'll be doing the uh, tourism ships and tourism ports. They control all of that. Now, our government makes money by building them th those ships. So they'll ask us to build, you know, let's say a cargo ship. And when we do, they pay us, our civilians pay us to build that. They also pay us a tax rate for all of the um, all of the economy going on in the civilian economy. But it's not controlled by us. So they'll be building up money, they'll be doing mining, they'll be doing all of this stuff. All we do is kind of build the big stuff. And we also build some of their ships for them and get paid for it. Uh, it's a very interesting concept that you just won't see in any other game. Uh, but let's get started, and we're going to make sure we're on paused, and we are, okay, and make sure that doesn't change. So we're going to stop, you know, right here, we're paused. And this is our home planet. Now, it's going to start giving us the basic tour, and we will go through this. Uh, there are a lot of good tutorial tool tips that happen here. You can see, if you don't want to look at this, you can disable all tours, or you can just disable this one if you want. But we're going to do all of that next time in episode two and really get started. The only thing I'm going to do is scoop back. You can see the gas giant here, Ascalon 5. Here is that rocky moon, Yerpa Miva. We are going to rename that. Uh, and then Trawas. This is our home planet. It's a no, it's not. Actually, it's a moon. It's a deep ocean moon. And we are, uh, well, you don't see it in this game rotating like you did in the first one, although they may add that eventually. But we are uh, orbiting Ascalon 5. And so this is a big gas giant. That's very important to find early because you get your fuel from big gas giants. But we'll talk more about that later. We are on a deep ocean moon, Trawas. And when we come back next time, we're going to start setting up our civilization. I can't wait. Till next time, Strategy Gaming Dojo. Have a good one.